think. Okay, and uh, we begin. Uh, hello again uh, to all of you and uh, to everyone who watches in the recording. So today we move on from kinematics to the next uh, logical topic, that is uh, robot dynamics. Um, this is uh, absolutely essential uh, to understand in order to interact with most uh, modern robotics literature. I hope some of it will be familiar, uh, but uh, what I'm going to give you is uh, quite quite important. So, you know, uh, even details that uh, are going to be new, if some of it, if even if the large picture is familiar, uh, which you know, I don't know if it is part of any program you've seen before, uh, is still valuable. So. Uh, is you know a foundational material. So let's try to make sure we understand the uh, content of this lecture. And all the following lectures will build on understanding this one. Okay, okay. Robot dynamics. So robot dynamics is uh, usually, not always, and doesn't have to be, but uh, usually is described using Lagrange equations. Big, uh, Big exception here is uh, Newton and Euler equations used to describe rigid bodies. So single rigid body doesn't have to be described uh, via Lagrange equations, can be described via, via Euler-Newton equations. And uh, single rigid bodies are quadrotors, most notably. So for quadrotors, uh, Lagrange equations and the like as it drones uh, without moving parts, as in propellers, uh, those are not necessarily used. Uh, but uh, for uh, everything else, uh, those are popular. I, I never, uh, yeah, so this is what is used for uh, manipulators, uh, equations, uh, Lagrange equations. This is what is used for um, uh, walking robots. Uh, for any types of uh, robots with robot arms, and so on and so forth, okay? But uh, not that for drones and for maybe underwater robots, those types of things, uh, you can use simple Newton oil equations, okay? Directly the same way as uh, you were taught uh, them in uh, theoretical mechanics. All right, but uh, for Lagrange equations, there is a little bit of a difference between what you were told in uh, theoretical mechanics and how we use them here. Um, just a little bit of a difference. I will explain until we can discuss uh, if uh, you feel, you know, if this difference feels large or small. So what is the difference? Well, first of all, we don't use this directly. Uh, we don't use this directly. If you examine software uh, on robotics, you will hardly find uh, any mention of this type of structure. If you use uh, look at uh, robotics papers, you would hardly ever find this type of equation anywhere there. This is a foundational equation, but this is not what is immediately used. Okay, this is not what is immediately used. Instead, we use a form where all of those derivatives, uh, all those derivatives, like this derivative, this derivative, this derivative, have already been taken. So we use a form where uh, you don't have derivatives there. You can describe uh, Lagrange equations, and sometimes people talk about it this way, as a um, PDE, partial differential equation, because of this partial differentiation, this total differentiation. I don't know if this is very useful to describe it this way. Uh, it's just a recipe to get a second order differential equation, I guess. That I think is a better way to describe it. But um, essentially, this is not something that you can plug directly into your uh, ODE 45, let's say. Okay, You cannot. You have to first get it into a different form. Okay. Hope that is clear. Uh, one more thing before we start. 
one more thing before we start. Um, I decided not to cover how we derive Lagrange equations. Maybe it was covered in theoretical mechanics. It is like it takes quite some time to cover, uh, but it is simple. Uh, so in case you don't know how to derive Lagrange equations from Newton equations, just look it up, or uh, you know, let me know. Maybe I can uh, cover it as a postscript somewhere. It is like it. It's not so long. It's not so difficult either. Okay, and uh, why is it important to understand how it's derived? Well, uh, there are some tricks which are kind of nice, uh, but uh, that are used in this derivation. Uh, but also, um, somehow, it is important not to feel mystified about it. This equation is not uh, somehow like any sort of profound truth that cannot be explored. Uh, it is just a derived formula, which is popular because it looks nice. There are a number of reasons why people like uh, equation one as a form. Like there are connections with uh, more general optimality conditions in variational calculus. Um, like this form appears there. Uh, on the other hand, it just looks nice. On the other hand, again, in theoretical physics, you always often have zero on the right hand side in this equation. And uh, there are a number of tricks uh, that can be used to make it uh, simpler. Um, we, we achieve this often by replacing kinetic energy with Lagrangian, and that uh, makes some makes equations even nicer, and so on and so forth. So there are a number of reasons why people like it. But uh, ultimately, it is just a derived equation. So there is nothing mysterious here. Uh, and um, one of the things important to realize about this equation and again, I'm talking about specifically like this equation, not uh, the whole theory that follows from it, is that um, it is derived with an understanding that uh, Q is linearly, uh, sorry, is independent variables. Okay. So Q is independent variables. Uh, this equation is all about uh this um representing um robot dynamics in terms of new coordinates instead of natural coordinates let's say for a group of material points it will be their co uh, coordinates in cartesian space xyz 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 instead we use some sort of new minimal coordinates q right and they, ha they have to be independent meaning if you know q1 q2 q3 there still is no way to know Q4. You have to get the information from somewhere else. You cannot just compute it as a, some sort of combination of Q1, Q2, Q3. Okay? So uh, Q uh, have to be independent variables. That is one of the assumptions behind this whole uh, equation. So uh, you know, there are uh, other ways to explore it. Um, I will leave it for now. But well, my whole point is, don't treat this equation as something outside of your reach. Derivations are quite, uh, quite graspable. If you, you know, if you want better understanding, just study it. Okay, good. Good. Excuse me. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I just have a question about uh, yes, the form ahead. of uh, Lagrange equation uh, yes. you wrote, uh, because I believe uh, I saw. Uh, Lagrange equations uh, using Lagrangian, where mm -hmm. uh, we have a partial derivative of uh, difference of uh, kinetic and potential energy. Yes, but, exactly. Yeah, there are other forms, but uh, with uh, forms where we have partial derivative uh, of, of kinetic energy, we also, mm -hmm. uh, I believe, we miss potential energy in this equation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, so uh, let me instantly comment on that. Um, normal form, uh, like not normal, but like one of the typical forms of Lagrange equations would have here and here, indeed Lagrangian, which is the kinetic energy minus potential energy. That's how Lagrangian is defined. So let me write it here. Lagrangian is uh, T minus P, uh, kinetic minus potential. Okay, good. Uh, what happens? Well, first of all, potential energy does not depend on Q dot, right? 
So uh, potential energy usually depends on Q, but not on Q dot. Uh, you can imagine, for example, uh, you know, potential energy depends on height or how high you are above the ground. That would be gravitational force potential energy. Potential energy of a spring depends on how uh, far you stretch the spring. That would be potential energy of the spring. None of them depends on uh, velocity. So uh, Q dot does not change them. So this derivative here, this partial derivative d l d q dot would uh, be zero for p component. So if we take partial derivative with respect to the velocity of uh, potential energy, we will get zero here. So, but uh, the fact that I replaced uh, Lagrangian with kinetic energy only matters here in this uh, for this partial derivative. That is the only place where it matters. Okay, now uh, what happens? Well, uh, if if this partial derivative was there, we would have had additional term uh, here. It would have been something like plus dp dq um, on the right, right? Um, right? Oh, minus, I think minus, right? Yes, minus dp dq. It would have been minus dp dq on the right. Let me write it. Okay, good. So this is how it would have looked. Uh, right. And what I did uh, was I call all of this tau. So my tau contains potential energy derivative. Derivative of potential energy is, uh, as we'll explain later, potential forces. So this uh, uh whole expression on the right is what I call tau. Uh, if um, if I had a dp dq on the right, tau would have would not have contained potential forces or conservative forces as we call them sometimes. Okay, hope this answers the question. Yep, thank you. No, thank you. Good question. Okay. So now uh, I'll move forward. Well, again, the equation bears discussion for like a whole lecture. So, but I will move forward. So uh, let us just try to start uh, with uh, you know understanding. First of all, what is kinetic energy? Well, for point mass, it is given as half of a mass times uh, velocity squared. And uh, we sum it over all point masses. Uh, velocity squared for a body moving in space is a dot product of a velocity with itself. Velocity is a vector, a vector uh, entity. So to square it, you dot product it with itself. Remember that uh, dot product of two vectors can be written as vector transposed times vector. So this is just a dot product. Uh, hope this is uh, familiar. Okay, okay. Now, for rigid bodies, indeed they have the same component, which refers to the velocity of the center of mass. So here we have for rigid body, kinetic energy consists of a sum of the one half mass times dot product of velocity is itself, so velocity squared. And here we refer to the velocity of the center of mass of the body. But that's not enough. Rigid bodies also have a rotational component, rotational component. And the rotational component is, uh, the kinetic energy of it is one half of angular velocity times inertia times angular velocity. So you could say here that um, you can say here that this is uh, some uh, somehow like angular velocity dot product with inertia times uh, angular velocity. Simply, if you want to, you can say it is a weighted dot dot product. Whatever is uh, <laughs> doesn't really matter. Uh, here, if you, you know, uh, they, they look slightly different, those two equations, but that is because M here is a scalar and I here is not a scalar. 
that is a big difference. You could have made the mass matrix diagonal with masses on all uh, diagonals, uh, but uh, does it does it mean anything? I don't know. So what we have here is a complete form of of uh, kinetic energy. Just important to see that here we have a vector times a matrix times a vector. Uh, is important to keep in mind. What is inertia, by the way, is a symmetric symmetric matrix uh, with uh, principal components of inertia on the di main diagonal and uh, all kinds of skew components of inertia on off the diagonal. Uh, yeah. The way how to compute inertia, inertia matrix, I think, should be studied in either theoretical mechanics or mechanics of machines or something like this. Uh, basically, there is this. Uh, is, you can find integral like integrals uh, describing how it's studied, as in, like let's say, first element in the first row, first column will be integral of a, a uh, ma mass elements d mass uh, uh, times uh, position of this mass elements. Uh, along like x-axis, as far as I know, squared. But you can find all those uh, formulas on the internet. Uh, we're not going to you to do it. And uh, in practice, in robotics, people rarely do it. Like this guy here, uh, the way we find it usually is uh, from CAD models. Or well, someone tells us about this. We don't usually compute it using uh, analytic formulas. And that is because in robotics, but every body part is usually more complicated than a sphere or a square. Usually they are quite complex you know, parts of the robots. In fact, um, if you attempted to get this eye from, let's say, CAD software and be done with it, that is not the best temptation. It is a good temptation, but not the best. Why? Because CAD will not tell you how much, let's say, cables are laid through this particular link, right? Or other, you know, details like the weight of the motor is not going to be included, and you have to include everything there. You cannot include just main main part. You have to include everything. That is why uh, usually we assume that something about this inertia we don't understand. So inertia is often understood as unknown parameter. Okay, every link we often say has, I believe, ten unknown parameters. Uh, inertia contains six unknown parameters. Okay, 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 okay. Now, uh, uh, I hope I give given you just some glimpse of what's going on. Now we can move on. Do we have questions about kinetic energy? No? Then we'll move on. All right. Uh, so we have here a description of how center of mass uh, velocity can be computed. So velocity of the center of mass, same as velocity of any type of point, can be computed via chain rule. We find a partial derivative of r with respect to q and times q dot, right? That is how we do it. So this gives us a angular velocity Jacobian times q, q dot, right? Very familiar stuff. Okay, Q dot in this case is generalized velocities. Please note this, this lecture, we are talking about generalized velocities. We are not talking about joint velocities. Uh, that is not something that uh, uh, you know I find in a lot of textbooks, but uh, I haven't read like <laughs> that many uh, varied textbooks in English specifically, all right? Uh, uh, but um, I think I can give you an idea of uh, what is the difference between generalized velocities and positions, you know, you know, coordinates, and joint velocities and coordinates. The difference is joint refers to joint joints, like actual joints. <laughs> okay, so let's say your robot is Kuka has six joints, so it would have six joint positions, six joint velocities, okay, six joint coordinates. 
has to do with joints. Let's say you have a, a robot with a spherical joint, spherical joint, uh, like shoulder joint, okay, spherical joint, uh, and two pin joints, like a one pin joint, another pin joint, okay? Let's imagine the situation, like a human arm. It would have five joint coordinates. So three in the shoulder, one in the joint, one in the joint, right? Why three in the shoulder? Because you have to have three coordinates to describe how the, uh, the shoulder is oriented. That's why. Okay, so, so, so far so good, right? So far clear. Uh, in this case, the number of generalized coordinates you would have is also five. It's exactly the same. No difference whatsoever. Now, imagine now you have a robot dog. Uh, here is a dog. Uh, fantastic looking. So it would have, let's say, um, two joints here, one joint here. So each leg has three joint coordinates. It has four legs, so it would have total three times four, uh, three times four, twelve joint uh, coordinates okay. but that is not all coordinates the robot has it also has a rigid body okay it has this rigid body and this rigid body would be uh would have its own separate uh would have its own separate uh coordinates how many coordinates would the rigid body have well as any rigid body it will be described by six independent coordinates, three translations, three rotations, okay? So far we're discussing a robot uh, floating in space. We don't describe how interaction with the ground changes its coordinates. So it will have six independent coordinates. So total number of coordinates is 18. But out of those 18, only 12 are joint coordinates. These are rigid body coordinates, single rigid body coordinates, uh, whatever. We can discuss, uh, f sometimes we call them floating base coordinates. Uh, we can discuss them in a very, very variety of terms. But those six are not joint coordinates. In literature, that's how we usually talk about it. Those 12 are joint coordinates. But together, they form generalized coordinates, generalized coordinates. This uh, macabre, uh, or better said, I know, Byzantine uh, system of notation is surviving. I think mostly because the only active area of application where generalized coordinates are not equal to joint coordinates are various uh, walking robots and uh, similar in nature machines, like mobile robots with arms, for example. Right? So you have a robot with wheels, and it has uh, two robot arms attached. So for those applications, it is actually completely meaningful to write separate equations for uh, the rigid body and separate equations for joint coordinates in order to write control and so on and so forth. Uh, usually we, we separate equations in those parts. So this somehow gives us a very uh, large incentive to use separate um, word joint coordinates and to use separate word for like floating base coordinates. And then when we talk Lagrangian mechanics, we say generalized coordinates. So you can kind of see uh, wh what we arrive at is this um, situation where two terms coexist because in some particular field, both of them are useful. Uh, but Lagrangian terminology is general, generalized. And to be generalized, they have to describe completely position of the robot. So you cannot say that 12 coordinates for robot dog is generalized coordinates. Not true at all. Um, they have to completely describe the whole dynamic of the robot. And they have to be independent. So you cannot compute one knowing the other. Okay. That, that definition, by the way, I pulled from Russian literature. Um, 
I'm not going to try to remember uh, which uh, which writer it comes from, but uh, there are like number of textbooks where this something like this will be given. Okay, good. Next. Uh, do we have questions? <laughs> I say next. If we have questions, so just ask. Okay. Uh, now let's consider rotations. For rotations, um, the, this whole situation is a little bit more complicated. But good for us, we already studied them. So for us, it is going to be simple. Um, so um, this formula, remember, uh, we already saw it. This omega is a skew symmetric form of angular velocity. T is a rotation matrix describing the orientation of the rigid body. So we already studied it. We know where it comes from. And uh, we already had uh, like a whole slide where this type of formulas were discussed. Here, we can even kind of like laugh at how naive this looks because it doesn't tell us tell us um, in which frames those are expressed and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, we, we can call it Poisson formula. This is again the Russian literature style notation. I haven't seen it outside of, uh, let's say, MFT uh, lectures. So um, we have to call this formula something. Unfortunately, we don't have a name. I hope they're not going to call it Euler formula or something. Uh, yeah, we need the original name for this thing. Uh, even though it is tempting to call it Euler formula because you can clearly derive it from uh, Euler style arguments. Okay, so we already saw it. And what is T? T is dt dq times q dot. You can say it, right? Uh, this is a little bit wild here. And I'm mostly showing it to you so later you won't be as shocked. So uh, I, here I'm doing uh, something like chain rule on a matrix. And what I mean is you take a derivative, partial derivative of T, it, it becomes three-dimensional, becomes a three-dimensional tensor. DT DQ is a three by three by N tensor. And then you multiply it by Q dot along the third dimension along the last dimension. Good? Good. So q dot multiplied along the last dimension. Great. And uh, that gives us back 3 by 3 t dot. So, you know, super. So what do we get from, uh, from this? Well, uh, this can be computed easily enough, I guess. And this has uh, this structure, you remember. It is uh, you know, last component, first component with minus signs, y component here. OK, good. So in order to compute velocity, angular velocity vector, we can just uh, take this, uh, we can just take this guy here, this we computed here, and uh, put its elements to good use. So this element goes here, this element goes here, this element goes here with appropriate minus signs. That's how we can compute it in software, let's see. Good, 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 good. So angle velocity can be computed this way. Okay. Now, uh, yeah, this is the voluntary homework. If you want to, you can try. Uh, I think we already proved it sufficiently, maybe, on the last lectures, but uh, you can try. It sounds uh, like a challenge, a little bit of a challenge. All right, anyway, uh, now what we can do is we can find angle velocity Jacobian, uh, as we did last time. And what we have is uh, this guy, d omega d q dot. Notice, not dr dq, d omega dq dot. Uh, quite interesting. Uh, uh, by the way, if you're wondering if it is possible to find a regular Jacobian as dv dq dot, 
it is possible and you can prove it. And this would be one of the steps at deriving Lagrange equations, proving that Jacobian is both dr dq and dv dq dot, as far as I remember. Uh, but uh, for angle velocity, it is just d omega dq dot. Okay. And uh, omega is linear with respect to q dot. So, so we uh, obtain this familiar expression omega equals to J uh, angular velocity Jacobian times q dot. So this, so far, last two slides was, was familiar because we did something similar before. Even last three slides, I guess, was familiar. Now let's put it to good use and uh, start doing something about Lagrange equations. So first of all, Lagrange equations, uh, let me quickly, before we do it, let me just quickly uh, show you them back. So notice r dot, r dot, omega, omega. We need to replace those. Now we know what those are. We need to replace it. So what we get is here linear velocity Jacobian times q dot, linear velocity Jacobian times q dot transposed, angular velocity Jacobian times q dot, angular velocity Jacobian times q dot transposed. That is uh, what we get when we substitute. Okay. Now, now uh, what we want is somehow to write t as a quadratic form with respect to q dot. We want to write t as a quadratic form with respect to q dot. How do we do it? Well, uh, notice that this is already a quadratic form with respect to q dot. So this is a matrix of a quadratic form. This is a matrix of a quadratic form with respect to q dot. Do you remember what quadratic forms are? Uh, tell me someone. Uh, did you study quadratic forms? Linear algebra? Mm, yep. Okay, good. So th those are quadratic forms, uh, matrices. So all we need to do is to just sum them. And uh, uh, we do it this way. We say that, let's say, h is sum of this and plus sum of this. And then the kinetic energy will be given as one half of q dot times h times q dot. So notice the way h appears, and h is going to be our friend for the last of the course. The way h appears is just by looking at the kinetic energy and recognizing that we can rewrite it in this form. Okay. And why? Because it is a kinetic energy is a quadratic form. Here is, there is a caveat. We can find systems where kinetic energy will be uh, not quadratic, but quadratic and linear. So it would have a linear component. That is possible, but uh, H here is a full quadratic component of kinetic energy. And I don't think you would encounter in practice those systems. But when you do, good to know that kinetic energy doesn't have to be quadratic. And if your kinetic energy happens to be not quadratic, Go ahead and think about uh, what to do. You can rederive all manipulated equations from the way I did uh, so far, uh, and the way I will do towards the end of the lecture, and uh, write your own dynamics equations. It is important to work with real stuff, not with formulas. So if your can engine happens to be not in this uh, you know, nice form. If your kinetic energy does not abide this rule, they rederive everything after that for your specific kinetic energy. It's not difficult. And that is kind of like the whole point of having education, right? You, you can fix um, something that textbook missed. Okay, good. Uh, let's move on and see how we can use this guy. 
So first of all, we can find derivatives of kinetic energy. But remember that it is a scalar. So the transpose of kinetic energy is equal to itself. So transpose of H would be equal to itself. We could have uh, shown it easier just by looking at the uh, <laughs> form of H. It is indeed symmetric. But there are so many ways to prove it. Okay. By the way, this, I think, maybe is even not the best argument to make. <laughs> this, I think, is not the best argument to make. Because you can indeed have a um, non-symmetric uh, quadratic uh, form matrix. It is just that you can always replace it with a symmetric an analog that will give you the same quadratic form. So this is not the best argument to make. <laughs> the best argument would have been through analyzing Jacobians. All right, anyway, it is symmetric, I promise you. <laughs> it is symmetric. Um, now, let's just start taking derivatives. So derivative with respect to q dot of, uh, and remember, what do we take derivative of? We take derivative of this expression here. OK. So derivative with respect to q dot is h times q dot. Uh, I could have written it more explicitly as something like q dot times h plus h times q dot. Right. Could have written it this way. Uh, I would have needed to transpose here on the on the left, but after transposing, I would have still gotten one half, right? One half, because uh, you know, how do you take a derivative of a function of uh, like of uh, multiplication of functions, right? Well, let me let me just uh, write it here. I think that maybe will be beneficial. One second. So how do we take a derivative of this function? First, we take a derivative with respect to this variable. Second, we take a derivative with respect to this variable, right? That's how you get, um, let me put it here, one half over this whole expression. So uh, first you get uh, like h and q, then you have q and h. But uh, when you take derivative with respect to this variable, you need to remember that it is transposed. So this whole thing here will be transposed. And it will be the same as this guy, because h is symmetric. So that is kind of like the whole uh, rigmarole you have to go through to prove uh, 11. Okay. But uh, if it is clear that 11 is uh, HQ, great. Okay. Now, uh, what is DT DQ? Well, DT DQ is like, you know, this was already a little bit uh, difficult. This, <laughs> much worse, much worse, uh, much worse. Uh, how do we? What is it doing? Well, first of all, q dot does not depend on q. Also, you will find uh, sometimes uh, wild expressions where you have q dot equals to, like, is a function of q. Uh, indeed, the, it is possible to do physics while considering that q dot depends on q. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's possible, like, uh, People do all kinds of wild, st wild stuff. Uh, but uh, here in this uh, case, q dot does not depend on q. So you don't have to mm, consider like multiplication of a you know um, uh, product of, a, of two functions. It is just a, uh, pro a derivative of h. h is the only thing that depends on q. 
but H is a matrix. So what you have here is something uh, strange looking. So one temptation that I think a lot of you can have uh, if you uh, have been kind of like inhaling chain rule uh, for a long time is to say that dh dq times q dot is h dot. I think that is a natural, natural wish to say so. I think it is very tempting to say that this guy here is h dot. It is not. <laughs> It's very important to realize it is not h dot. Uh, it is not h dot. Can someone prove to me why it is not h dot? Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, I'm kind of asking this question to, you know, for you to try to try to see if you can find the reason about it. But this is not true. Okay, let me give you uh, the proof. I mean, the like the argument. Those two multiplications, they happen along. Uh, this happens along second dimension. This happens along first dimension. Okay, of the matrix. This differentiation sends H into the third dimension. So the tensor, resulting tensor, is n by n by n. Let's for a second imagine that q dot has m element. Oh, let's say k element, just so you, my pronunciation doesn't uh, get us into trouble. Um, let's say q dot has k elements. Okay, k elements, but q has n elements. I understand that this is nonsense, right? Uh, but that uh, would illustrate my point very well. So let's just for a second imagine that. So q dot has one number of elements, and q has a different number of elements. Okay. So k here and n here. So that would imply that h is k by k matrix. k by k. Good. But Derivative of H with respect to Q would be K by K by N. Why? Because, uh, you know, how many Qs you have, that is how many uh, slices you would have of this matrix uh, along the third dimension. So it would be K by K by N. Now it is obvious that you cannot multiply it by Q dot because Q was K dimensional. So when you multiply it by q dot on the right on the left, what you are supposed to have is what you would expect, n dimensional vector. It just happens to lie along, along the third dimension. So this also implies that even this whole expression here is somehow incomplete. Uh, we should also somehow imply that this third dimensional uh, derivative would stand back <laughs> along the first dimension along the first dimension. So there should be some sort of tensor transpose saying, please stand up. Don't lie across the third dimension. Uh, yeah. Numbers, right? Difficult. Uh, it is here, it is just important not to uh, lose the fact of uh, like different dimensionalities going uh, astray. Hopefully, maybe you will not have to deal with this uh, like very directly. But uh, the consequence of this being not quite this, right, uh, are significant, are significant. All right, now let us uh, examine what we get. So this is what we got. This is what we got. Now let's examine what what we get from this. So first, what we get uh, is we have to take a time derivative of h and q dot. 
uh, Lagrange equations now appear in this form, right? Time derivative of, of h and q dot minus this uh, monstrosity. Okay. Now, time derivative of, of h and q dot can be opened naturally. How? Well, uh, what is what is uh, derivative of q uh, h times q dot? Well, it is derivative of a product. So h times q double dot plus h dot q dot. Same as before. We already did it a few times this course. It's quite natural. Okay, this monstrosity stays the same. So this stays the same. Okay. Now, this monstrosity happens to be linear with respect to <laughs> with respect to uh, joint velocities. If you allow to introduce a function, uh, it's not linear. Of course, it's not linear with respect to the joint velocities. It's completely not. It is um, best case quadratic. Uh, usually not even that. Uh, I mean, maybe it is usually quadratic, I cannot say. But uh, usually C is a function of uh, generalized velocities, and we can find such C that we would get C times Q dot equals to this whole thing. This whole thing. Not surprising. I mean, we have here Q dot, we have here Q dot. Uh, somehow it feels natural that we would have such a matrix H dot here, in such a matrix uh, one half q dot times this tensor here that would get some sort of a c okay and in robotics this uh replacing this whole thing with c q dot is popular because it leads to often nice equations this is i have seen it being used very actively in uh, underactuated robotics in general, I guess the legacy of the field uh, requires you to understand how CQ dot is being computed. Although there are alternative formulas, forms, forms, which does not require do not require computation of C matrix C. But matrix C is popular, so it's good for you to understand how you can go from uh, from here to here, right? It is good for you to understand it because uh, is it is used in the literature. So good. Let's try. Let's try. Let's try to do it. So this whole thing together, if you want just c times q dot as the expression together, can be computed using Christoffel symbol based formula. It is computed this way. You say that, uh, uh, so this is a vector, remember. Matrix times a vector is a vector. So each element of this vector is a sum over two indices. So all possible j and k from one to n, uh, given here q, dot k q dot j and here you have Christoffel symbol is a tensor uh, so we have uh, sorry about the interruption uh, we have uh, Christoffel symbol is a tensor it doesn't matter for you this much uh, that is a tensor. Um, you have explicit formula. You work with it as a collection of scalars, basically. So you do it this way. What is gamma time sub, you know, i, j, k? Notice that gamma here, the first, uh, <laughs> like less boxes. So the, on the, the first symbol changes across rows. Everything else stays the same. So uh, what is gamma? Well, gamma is just this lovely uh, expression. Uh, 
uh, isn't it great, right? So for each Christoffel symbol, all you need to do is take three partial derivatives. Three partial derivatives, right? Three. <laughs> and uh, of what? Of elements of H. Elements of H. And do you remember what elements of H are? Remember when we uh, how we found H? H was the sum of all Jacobians. Angular velocity, linear velocity. So H is quite a complicated matrix. It's not, not easy matrix. It's complex. And uh, we take three partial derivatives to find one Christoffel symbol. And we will have to have n squared of those symbols to find one element of uh, C Q dot. Ultimately, this guy here is the most complicated part of Lagrange equations. Everything else is much simpler. This guy is the most complicated part. And this is actually not the uh, not, not a very slow way of, to compute them. It's not the fastest way, not the most, uh, but it's uh, no, not so bad, not so bad. OK. So uh, this, I think, is often taught as the main way to compute uh, CQ dot. OK, now, if we just want to compute C, matrix C, not uh, C times Q dot, matrix C can be computed this way. Uh, for To get the element ij of the matrix C, you'll find uh, the sum over k for gamma ijk times qk. So essentially, what you can say is that you take this Christoffel symbol tensor, you multiply it along the third dimension by generalized velocities. But I think thinking about it in terms of tensors, uh, in this case, is just misleading. Instead, just carefully use notation here. You see it is j r i j k, and you have to multiply it along k dimension. What is i j k concretely? Well, here is explained what they are concretely. i j k it means uh, k would be here, here, and here. So here it would be what you take derivative with respect to. Here it would be. Uh, the number of the column. Here will be the number of the row. That's it. That's it. So that's how that's how you work with Christopher symbols. Questions so far. No questions. OK, so Christopher symbols. Now, you don't have to use them. They look quite esoteric. And uh, there. <laughs> you can instead directly find this guy. How? Uh, well, just as 18 says, uh, just multiply, um, you know. What is 18? 18 says, well, uh, it was a big mistake to open the brackets here. Let's not open them. <laughs> we'll keep the brackets and take derivative of this uh, scalar. So here is uh, how we do it in MATLAB. I'm showing it to you as a MATLAB code. You can do it in any code. Uh, importantly, it is a symbolic math. It is a symbolic math. Uh, I don't know if you studied symbolic mathematics yet. Symbolic math, math means that, for example, V, um, DHDT, etc., all of those are symbolic variables. Symbolic variables. Um, so the, the symbolic expressions, I guess. V, in this case, symbolic variable. DT is symbolic expression. Q, symbolic variable. H, symbolic expression. OK. Um, OK. So. Notice what we do here. Uh, to compute this, we just say, OK, here is a dh dt, which we computed elsewhere. Here is times v, so that is q dot. 
uh, very shaped into uh, a form where it will be uh, vertical. So first dimension is length of V, second dimension is one. Good. Now, with this guy, it is much more complicated, uh, but not, not too bad. So we computed one half V transpose H V, take a Jacobian with respect to Q, then reshape it into the same shape. Complicated, but still, you know, decent. And that is how you can find uh, this expression without uh, Christopher symbols. This is one line. That is nice. Christopher symbols would have had like cycle four and cycle four and cycle four. Uh, but this is slow. This is slow. This is slow. Because uh, this expression here, this Jacobian here, will be very difficult. It is a very large expression to compute. And for symbolic math, that is crucial. Uh, I'm not sure if you will be able to compute it for like a bipedal robot. Maybe you would, but it will be difficult. All right, next possibility. Uh, do we have questions about this one? All right, I think it's straightforward. So next one is a little bit crazy. Uh, so let me show you. We can compute C times Q dot. <laughs> in this form. Uh, what is it? <laughs> what is it? Uh, well, it is uh, vectorized H. So H vectorized means H was a matrix. It was kind of, let me show you, I guess, in, in picture. Imagine H was kind of like this. One column, another column another column, another column, right? What it becomes, what becomes is, um, well, let me, I guess, show it like this. You take the first column, you put it um, kind of like this, right? Then you take the second column, You put it below it, right? Then you take the third column, you put it below it. You take the fourth column, you put it below it. So that's how you stack the columns uh, one uh, under another. Okay. The first column will be on top. So, uh, next one will be uh, below it, next below it, etc. So this is how vectorization works. That's how vectorization works. So here, uh, dvec h dq gives us a relatively straightforward thing. It is just a Jacobian of uh, n squared vector with respect to n elements. So it is a very uh, tall matrix. OK, good. Now, next is we multiply it by q dot times q dot except it's not times it is a chronicle product chronicle product uh is um i'm a little bit afraid to miss some detail it's one with each something like this one with each Uh, right? Is it right? Is it not right? Let me let me think. Would be right or would not be right? One is. I think what we're missing here is a transpose as uh, a suspect because uh, here we would have we need to have a transpose here. I think then I think it would make sense. Or this guy has to be somehow maybe on the left here. 
right? Yeah, see here is a, uh, we have a transpose here. So interesting, interesting, interesting. Yep. So this will be one with each. Uh, so it will be like Q1 times Q. So Q1 times the whole Q uh, stacked with Q2 times the whole Q stacked with Q3 times the whole Q. So this would also be n squared uh, high vector. And it would multiply this uh, now after after we take transpose, it will be very wide uh, Jacobian. So we'll multiply this wide Jacobian with a uh, very tall uh, vector here. And we get uh, n, like as usual, we get n vector. How do we derive it? Let's not go there. Same as Kronecker symbols, same as everything else. Uh, what is interesting, it is quite possible to write it in MATLAB. Uh, in MATLAB, what you do is, I mean, in Python it will be the same. So it's, uh, I just use MATLAB code for simplicity. So this it remains exactly the same as before. Uh, by the way, here notice I uh, use three dimensions. I don't uh, specify the length. The MATLAB would understand what I'm asking. Uh, say, uh, put all elements into this dimension. This dimension has to be one. That is what uh, this notation here says. Okay, now uh, we just say reshape H into the same dimension. By the way, this use of reshape can be replaced with just a VEC H. MATLAB also has a VEC operation. Also, it can be uh, changed with H. Uh, let me just write it. Uh, the two other options are VEC H. This is one option. Another option is uh, H uh, brackets semicolon, colon, sorry. H brackets colon. So both of those will be equivalent to, uh, to this. Oh, sorry. Uh, would be equivalent to this. So this can be replaced with any any of those commands. Okay. Uh, then you take a Jacobian with respect to Q of this guy, and you multiply it by Kronecker uh, product of uh, V. This, I think, uh, is slightly faster or slightly slower. Um, basically, you, you don't get like any magical boost of uh, productivity with any of those. Uh, but one, one of them is uh, quite slower. Well, to be honest, I, I'm forgetting which, which is slower. Um, yeah. I have a suspicion that this will be slower because of how elegant it looks on the page. I think that might be slower than uh, Koronika symbols, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. All right. Anyway, here is another code. Uh, it works. I personally think this is the most pretty one because it operates uh, with uh, Jacobians. Does uh, you know uh, like clean multiplications and so on. You don't multiply into scalars and produce a Jacobian. That to me looks a little bit ugly uh, for symbolic math because uh, like you know you do. You combine the element to then divide it. it just doesn't look right to me. Uh, however, yeah. So this looks to me very close to what Kronecker symbols do. It's just that we operate with matrices here. Okay, okay. Uh, questions about this? This one. I understand that this is a little bit crazy, but All right. No questions. Good. <laughs> <laughs> we dodge the bullet. Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah it, you know, it works. Uh, and you can use it uh, for other derivations as well, like the style of our uh, work. Okay, uh, before we go on, let me just give you a few words in general about this uh, situation. So in practice, you're not going to do, most likely, you're not going to do this or any other ones. <laughs> You're not going to do this. Uh, why? Because it is slow. It is slow. Um, why is it slow? Well, because uh, here you're not taking advantage of the 
underlying structure of your problem. Uh, there is even more structure than just what uh, what is written here. There are Jacobians inside those H's, and those Jacobians can be exploited. So uh, you can do this uh, the way I've written here. Uh, if you do it in, let's say, symbolic math in MATLAB, what will often happen is that for bigger robots like KUKA or uh, dog robots or anthropomorphic robots, it will break down if you do it uh, not very carefully. Uh, it can work, but uh, sometimes uh, you just run into two big expressions. The solution for that is uh, to use auto differentiation, something like Casadi. I don't know if you heard of Casadi. It is popular with uh, MPC, uh, trajectory optimization, and so on. Uh, popular software package. Uh, so Casadi provides you auto, auto differentiation. That is alternative to symbolic math. Uh, in Python, symbolic math is even weaker than in MATLAB, as far as you know. So you would even faster have to resort to Casadi. What Casadi does, it cannot print you very nice equations like symbolic math in MATLAB does. Instead, it uh, allows you to generate C code. Uh, MATLAB, uh, symbolic expression in MATLAB and uh, in Python also, as far as I know, allow you to generate C code. In MATLAB, for sure. In Python, I don't know. Didn't test. So you can generate C code either way, but C code generated with uh, with uh, Kasadi has a advantage that you can generate it for very large problems. It after a while becomes intractable, intractable too. So it is not a magic bullet; cannot solve any problem. Uh, but uh, it breaks much further down the road than MATLAB does. So. Uh, that is the way. But ultimately, all that we see here is not optimal. The optimal way is to study geometry of the problem uh, qu quite deeply uh, and uh, provide expressions which require no differentiation at all. No differentiation at all. So uh, you can derive all of those things, including C matrix, without a single differentiation. That is impressive to say the least. And all of this is based on geometry of Jacobians and linkages. And uh, in order to achieve, uh, the way I think about it is, uh, it is kind of like doing out differentiation by hand and uh, without actual out differentiation, you just uh, geometrically find everything. Uh, the papers that describe those processes are so hard that uh, I know people with uh, physical education in best universities of this country who have uh, trouble understanding some part of those papers. So it is enormously complicated, unfortunately. Uh, you will be able to read them if you study them very hard. But uh, you don't have to. You don't have to study very hard. What you can do instead is to just use software packages. Uh, one of the software packages that used to be popular was uh, Drake by MIT. Uh, there is a famously uh, software package already implemented in MATLAB in uh, Robotics Toolbox. Uh, those are not optimal, but they're very good. Uh, as far as I know, the most optimized software package available right now is Pinocchio. Pinocchio. Uh, that is the one where they use, take full advantage of Jacobians, etc. Pinocchio, as far as I know, is the most optimized software package. But I didn't run tests uh, against Drake and other ones, so I cannot really say. Uh, but uh, it is quite optimized. So if you are going to do this in practice, uh, one of the good bets is to just use a software package already written or study the mechanics uh, of the problem enough so that you can write equivalently fast code. Alternatively, if the fast code doesn't really concern you, you can just do it the way I showed it in the lecture. Uh, either way, you have to understand what's going on. And specifically, it is very important to understand why C matrix is so difficult. Often, model, uh, modern algorithms don't require a C matrix explicitly. And if they don't require a C matrix, 
and uh, for some reason you can get away without it great <laughs> don't uh, kill your uh, you know uh, software trying to get it it is the most complicated part of uh, Lagrange equations but on the other hand uh, usually usually uh, you, what you need is linearization. Linearization would require a symmetrix. All right, uh, or at least C times Q dot. All right, that is all I have time to say about the C times Q dot. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left, so let me just finish uh, what, what we have. But I hope you kind of get the picture of uh, what's going on with Lagrange equations. Now, just to, to remind you, C times Q dot, that was um, that was this part of Lagrange equations. Well, this is Lagrange equations, and this part specifically is C times Q dot. So now that we know how to find it, we know everything. We have H times Q double dot plus C times Q dot equals to tau. Okay, so we uh, more or less know everything. Okay, okay. Um, now, uh, what about external forces? Well, external forces uh, can be linked to tau. Tau is generalized forces, we call it. it can, uh, they can be linked via Jacobian transposed. So you already saw uh, how velocities are linked to generalized velocities via Jacobian. So uh, generalized velocities times Jacobian gives you Cartesian velocities, right? So not surprisingly, Cartesian forces or external forces, whatever, uh, are linked to generalized forces via Jacobian transposed. Okay, that's how it is. Uh, so R in this expression is a point of application on, of F. The same can be done with torques. So if you have external torque applied to the rigid body, corresponding generalized force is tau equals to j omega transposed times external torque, where j omega transposed, uh, j omega is the angular velocity Jacobian of the rigid body to which the torque is applied. Torque cannot have a point of application. It can only have a body of application. It can be applied to a rigid body, not to like a point in space. So this is the angular velocity Jacobian of the rigid body, and that is an applied torque, and that's a generalized uh, uh, force that it creates. Okay. Uh, both of those, of course, needs to be expressed on the same basis, as usual, as usual with those things. Okay. This you can think of as being a second uh, this you can think of as being a second way to use Jacobians. Before we use Jacobians to map generalized ve uh, velocities to Cartesian velocities. Now we use Jacobians to map forces to generalized forces. Um, that is quite important. That is quite important. The reason it is important is that uh, not only we can put external forces into Lagrange equations, we can also just find how external forces act on our robot. And alternatively, if we remember that uh, action equals reaction, uh, if our robot acts on something and receives external force F in exchange, uh, and if we wanted that, that means we apply external forces onto this something, right? This is how we will do force control later. So this provides us uh, relations needed for force control. Uh, torque control is a little bit less common, but uh, we could do it this way. Okay, so this is quite important. Please keep it in mind. Okay, good. Now, uh, if you have conservative forces, such as gravitational forces, springs, etc., you can find them uh, by finding potential energy and taking a partial derivative of the potential energy with a minus sign. That gives you potential forces. You, you can treat them as external forces if you want, and uh, just put them uh, 
Uh, but this is already generalized, generalized uh, forces, so you don't need any Jacobians here. That is answer to the first question uh, that was asked uh, this session. Um, where did the Lagrangian go? Well, uh, we, <laughs> we just treat uh, those as generalized forces. That's it. But uh, we could have put this guy back into the Lagrangian. Uh, for my purpose, since my, my goal was to show you H, how H is derived, uh, making Lagrangians uh, is there would have only made it more complex for no reason. But uh, yeah, we could put it back and have a Lagrangian, of course. So this is typically for gravitational and elastic forces. Okay. Now, our form without uh, gravitational elastic forces looks like this. With gravitational elastic forces, it looks like this. This, I think, is extremely popular. This is extremely popular. You would find it a whole lot in especially manipulator literature. Uh, part of the reason it is popular is because uh, you can do something specific with those matrices and vectors to get somewhere. Part of it is just tradition. Okay. So well, this is popular. This you would find very often. Uh, often enough, also, you would combine those two elements, so those two elements here, into a single element C, and you get this expression. This, I think, becomes more and more popular in uh, optimization-based uh, methods, uh, control methods, because uh, usually we don't take advantage of this structure uh, here. And uh, for us, it is sufficient to look at it this way. Okay, okay. Even though, uh, even though this form, specific this form, we will use it next week uh, to show you some of the properties of uh, control approaches. So uh, while this is uh, uh, not necessarily useful directly in practice, it is useful in derivations. Okay, okay. Now, uh, uh, there is another form, which I didn't show you, but uh, that would also have additional element. I will just uh, show it, that additional element, plus f uh, q dot, plus f q dot. Uh, what is this f q dot does? It is uh, dissipative forces. So it would be, uh, f would be here a matrix depending only on q. C depends on q, q dot. F would be matrix depending only on q and it will be dissipative forces. Uh, that often happens. It often happens because you have uh, friction in joints. But uh, yeah, is, uh, you can put those dissipative forces in tau, but uh, you can also put them directly here. Depends. Depends on what you want. Not all robots would have dissipative forces, but many of them do. So I feel like Kuka robot would definitely do it, have it. Okay, okay, and we are almost done. Uh, the last part is uh, to see how we solve them. And uh, <laughs> this is trivial to almost uh, kind of like funny degree. All you need is to just find Q double dot, right? And how to do it? Well, you multiply both sides by H inverse. And H inverse always exists. Why? Well, because kinetic energy is always positive when you have positive velocities. You can prove it another way. You can prove it uh, by considering uh, that uh, generalized coordinates are always uh, independent and so on. But um, physically, you can say, yeah, kinetic energy is always positive when you have positive velocities. Therefore, it is full rank. H will have to be full rank. Uh, positive definite matrix. Uh, energy is a positive definite function. And uh, you can always invert and here is exactly what we do. We invert it. And that's it. Uh, that is always possible. Uh, we'll go back to it later, uh, sometime, when we'll discuss how in physical systems it is always possible to find higher sort of derivative, because, you know, uh, the system will have to go somewhere. It is a physical system. It has a trajectory. Uh, it's not undetermined. 
So it's always possible to find one and only one highest order derivative. That is quite important and that uh, allows us to do some interesting algebra. All right, all right. I think that is it. Yeah, this is it for today. Uh, here are some suggestions you can uh, just look uh, for self-study. Uh, uh, today we just looked at how to derive manipulator equations from uh, Lagrange equations. It was not easy, but uh, was doable. Next time, we will start to use them to do control. Not con linear controls that you maybe studied with me, I don't know, maybe with someone else. Uh, probably if all of you are bachelors from uh, from Innapolis, then you probably studied it with me, uh, most likely. Uh, is it true? Wait, is it true? Uh, is any yeah, studied is, with you. All of you studied it with me, right? Linear control. Is that yeah. true? Oh. Okay, good. Uh, then uh, you'll notice the, what I'm going to give you next lecture will be nothing like linear control, except you will use Lepunov functions. That we studied, I think, and uh, that will be useful. But uh, next lecture we'll do linear control. Oh, sorry, non-linear control. Control for rigid bodies like this. It will be based very heavily on these equations, uh, but on uh, more specifically on these equations. But uh, you will see how different it is from a linear control approach. Both are complementary. You have to know both to do robotics. So uh, here you would uh, start to fill out the other part of the puzzle. Some parts you already filled in linear control. Now you fill the other part of the puzzles. OK. I think that is it. Uh, that's it for the, the lecture. If you have any questions. Well, if not, uh, we'll see each other next week. And uh, if if something uh, here becomes, uh, you know, uh, give, gives you questions soon, don't uh, hesitate. You can write in the chat and such. All right. See you then. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye.